What is it that makes a country extraordinary? Its monuments? Its art? Its cities reflecting its history? Italy is bursting with beauty. Beauty you can admire, beauty you can immerse yourself in. But nothing tells the Italian story more than its tastes and aromas. An essence you can only discover when you live it fully. An essence that awakens memory and all the senses, becoming almost tangible in a glass of Prosecco surrounded by the hills. In a pizza, fresh out of the oven at the foot of Vesuvius, taste and aroma transport us to the places where they were created. To the names and origins we proudly protect, they evoke the intimate connection between humankind, enchanted lands, and majestic cities. They are the guardian of our history, the heritage of traditions dating back centuries, living on in the age-old skills repeated by new generations, telling us who we are today while whispering to us about the future, encapsulated in our products and carrying our greatest art, the art of living. And there is no greater value worth protecting, nor better product worth exporting. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us today on our Italy live stream. Hope that you enjoyed that little video that we started with today and it will give you a little flavor of what we're gonna be talking about this evening. My name is Liz and I'm based in Dublin, Ireland and I look after the products that we book for our tenant tours, travelers going to Ireland, the UK and Italy. For the past couple of weeks, we've been focusing on some of the destinations that we feature. So far, we've talked about doing whiskey tours in Scotland and whiskey tasting, whale watching in Iceland, the craft of love spoons in Wales, and making chocolate biscuit cake with a former royal chef in London, England. These are all still on our social channels, so if you'd like to go back and view them, you're going to find them there. Today we're going to be talking about Italy, specifically about the region of Puglia and the Tuscan countryside. We'll be speaking with Federico, who is standing by right there. To um, Federico represents our Italian partners, Ital Camel. He's going to be talking to us about these two regions and highlighting the unique features of these areas. And during the presentation today, we'll have two opportunities for you to win some Ten and Tours travel accessories or a free wine tasting experience on an Italy tour. So do listen closely and watch out for the questions to win. And of course, at any time during the presentation, feel free to send us in your questions and comments and I'll watch out for those and pass them on to Federico during our chats. So without further ado, we should say hello to Federico. It is 8 p.m. in Italy now, so I guess we should say buonasera. Ciao. Ciao e buonasera, Liz. How okay. are you? I'm, I'm very good. Thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me. Giving you a opportunity for joining us. us. We thank really you. appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So I suppose we should start by saying that, um, you know, when you and I planned this presentation quite a number of weeks ago, we were in a different situation and things have shifted slightly um, all over the world um, as we are now in this dreaded second wave of COVID right now and some restrictions have been reimposed. But I guess what I wanted to ask was how are things in Italy now compared to what happened back in February and March when you were suddenly hit by this virus and now you have had some restrictions reimposed. Is it easier or are people learning to live with it more? Correct. Okay, well, thank you, Liz. Well, the situation today is very different from what it was like back in March. I mean, we are on, uh, we've been limited, okay, on certain activities, but it's definitely not comparable to back in March. I mean, honestly, the only thing that really would affect my life, I mean, my normal life today uh, would be the fact that you know bars and restaurants they they they, they have to close at six p.m. Okay, okay. Uh, and this has been of course like to limit the number of people like around in the evening, which has been kind of classified as unnecessary risk. Okay, uh, but for the rest of the day, you know, from six a.m. to you know to pretty much all day long, you know, you can do um, everything you want. You can, I mean, I'm based in Milan today. I mean, tomorrow I can take a car and go to Venice, and then I can take a train and go to Rome, I can take a plane and go to to Naples. I mean, there is nothing that would really 
stop me right now. I mean, mm -hmm. if you mentioned correctly, I would think that people has, has learned how to live a little bit more, like with the, with the virus, everybody would wear a mask, you know, indoor and outdoor today, of course. And then the government, of course, invites us, I mean, just to limit, you know, unnecessary risk. So, for example, just sure. to limit the like, number, you go and visit people, like, uh, um, you know, big gatherings. That's what they, they, they ask you to limit, okay? Okay, very good. And what is the feeling in the travel industry in Italy? I mean, this is a sixty million dollar question. You know, right. when do you think that you know some kind of normality is going to come back to this industry that we work in? Right. Well, I mean, I have to say, I mean, of course, Italy is still close as European Union, you know, to the U.S. travelers, for example. Uh, yeah. We had a lot of uh, traffic during the summer. I have to say, you know, of course, because the, the, the limitations, they work the way around. So a lot of Italians that would not travel anywhere else, you know, they, they kind of have to travel within Italy. So typical months of Italians traveling are July and August in particular. So we had a lot of movement there was two, there was during those months. And then uh, it went down again, like in September when the schools opened. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. Now the big, I would say the big wave or medium wave of, of tourists, it's usually expecting the winter for the skiing season. Okay, after the Dolomites, and then we start the day after Christmas, and it ends at Easter time usually. Um, I mean, of course, I mean the, the destinations that really suffer the most are the big cities because everybody, you know, wants to be somewhere but like far away from big cities. So you know, you know, like countryside, the mountains, you know, the beaches, you know, somewhere where you can actually take a break and stay open air as much as you can. Mm -hmm, exactly. And I did read that of all of the countries um, affected by the lack of US tourists traveling this year, right. that Italy was the most affected. Um, would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, we have uh, partners, especially in Rome, for example, like a few hotels that the, the, today they're still closed. They're closing right. March. And then because there's so much reliant, I mean, rely so much on the American market that they, they decided you know, not even to open. Uh, you okay. know, and to wait until, you know, the situation like eases down a bit, you know. It's, sure. It, yeah. There are certain destinations that have been impacted a lot. Like Venice has been the worst in terms of like a decrease in terms of uh, visitors. You know, Venice, Rome, Sorrento, you know, all like, I mean, mm -hmm. the opposite that it usually is, you know. I mean, those destinations are always like impossible to travel to because of like to super, uh, super booked up, you know, now, yeah. I mean, it's the way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I think everything is going to change for next year and are you seeing that already in the industry that people are looking for more countryside activities and things that they can do like in their own little bubbles etc yeah yeah we had like a, a good number of requests already for next year for especially like those destinations that we're going to present today which i think is yeah. very very much in line with what is uh, what is the number of requests we're receiving um i mean also sometimes we get a request for like self-catering Okay, accommodations like villas and mansions and not apartments. They usually like villas with a garden and a private pool. Yeah, you know, be like as far away as possible from the others. Why are still at the destinations? Like just mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all of us in the worldwide travel industry are hopeful of two things, I guess, that one, the vaccines are approved and rolled out as quickly as possible, and that two, some sort of rapid testing and tracing i can't say that properly test, test rapid testing and tracing uh, will come in to airports pre-departure and on arrival in destination to allow some sort of travel to happen again yeah. um and again i should just say that tenantors are here and we are still making trips happen so do contact us if you're looking to make um this uh, trip to italy happen we'll be happy to help you put you in touch with our travel specialists and we'll also explain about our flexible cancellation terms and payment protection policies that we have put in place as well so just before we get started with the Puglia presentation, we are going to have our first competition for some Tenant Tours travel accessories. You will hear the answer in the presentation that Federico is going to give us now. And the first person to comment with the correct answer wins the prize. And this is an easy peasy one. The question is, it is legal to dig up an olive tree in Puglia, true or false? Okay, Federico, over to you. I'm going to let you take over now and talk to us all about Puglia. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, we prepared perfect. a small presentation. Okay, there's some pictures and some information. Okay, one second. Yeah. 
Okay, here it is. Let me know, Liz, if you see what I'm seeing. We like, do. And I'm gonna mute myself at the moment. Okay, perfect. So it is a small presentation we, we, we created about Puglia and we added Matera, which is, of course, a very famous destination. It's not within Puglia, but it's usually associated with it. So what you see here, of course, is the, this very one of the very typical things that you see in Puglia, which is the Trullo, which is this, uh, this very particular like uh, uh, building. Uh, there used to be houses, okay, every... I mean, I'll show you a little bit later, like a very famous place. Of course, most of them today are being used for a touristic reason. I mean, the one you see in the pictures, you are like shops, uh, but you can find, uh, you can actually rent them as a set catering um, uh, like apartment. Okay, so very, very quick point, you know, that we always uh, tell our clients, okay, where is Puglia? Okay, this is a map of Italy and Puglia, of course, for those that you don't know, it's the very bottom eastern part of, um, of Italy, okay? Uh, Liz, correct me if I'm wrong, is it the hill of the, of the booth? Okay. The hill. Yes, exactly. Okay, so this is how you say it. it's exactly the same. We, we call it in Italy. Il Tacco. Tacco is the hill of the boot, which is a stivale. Okay, it's a very long region itself. Okay, as you can see, it's very narrow and, and it stretches down like uh, quite a while. Um, we do usually divide it into three. Okay, so it's easier for, for the clients to understand and for the clients to get around. So there is a northern part, which is this one okay, like uh, around Foggia, there is a center part around Bari, and then there is a southern part that goes from Brindisi all the way down like to the very bottom. Uh, this, this division of like northern, center, and south, um, it's of course for a geographical reason, but also because the three regions are very different one to the other. And then um, in this small presentation, we could give you like some information on um, where you would want to go, okay, on a trip to, to Puglia. Um, okay, so of course the highlights, and then of course the very first highlights that we have in Puglia is of course the olive trees. I mean, no matter where you are, north, center, or south, you know, olive trees are like a must, and then you're gonna see them everywhere. You know, we decided to, to pick these three pictures, okay, because again, whether you're in the countryside, you know, like open the air in the airfield, or like by the beach, you know, this is one thing that from north to south, to the inland to the beaches, you know, you're gonna see olive trees. Uh, it's one of the, the most typical things you, you find in Puglia and no other region in Italy, you have such a big concentration of olive trees. Um, it's very interesting uh, because of course, I mean, they are like, of course they're protected, even though, you know, they are producing olives for, for the olive oil. Uh, some of them, like this one here, like in the top, you know, they, they could be very old, I mean, up to 200 years old. Um, and then of course, for the Pugliese people, I mean, I would say they're kind of like sacred trees, okay? So uh, very nice if you go in, you, you, of course, you take pictures, you do everything, but don't take away a branch, don't do anything to them because they're, it's, I mean, they're very proud and they're very protective um, towards their trees, okay? Um, okay, so just going back to the, to the division of Puglia, you know, northern, center, and south. So let's talk about the northern part, okay, which makes more sense. Um, this area is also called the Imperial Puglia, which relates to the um, to the home of Frederick II, which was the king of Germany, it Italy, and the early Roman Empire back in the days. Um, so, for you to know, of course, this will probably be one of your main getaway in and out of the region. Bari, which is the largest city of Puglia, you can see a ni very nice pictures here, it's by the, it's, it's by the sea, of course, and uh, it has the largest airport in the area. So usually when you would travel by air into Puglia, Bari is usually either the arrival point or the exit point. Uh, Bari itself, it's a beautiful town, it's, it's a city, it has more than 300,000 people living there, so it's a fairly big for Italian standards. And uh, as we usually say, it's it's a combination of different cities. Of course, it's, it is a city that lives like a modern time. So you have like all the hustle and bustle of a normal city. But then of course you have all the city that lives by the sea. So you have the, the, the fish market, you have like uh, the port, you have like that kind of environment. Um, which is very interesting to, to visit. And then you have a massive and a very interesting um, downtown, historical center, which you can see here, it's very narrow. It's, uh, it's um, how do you say, um, between medieval and Baroque time. 
okay? The, the big church you see here is, of course, is the, the most important thing that you would need to see in, uh, in Bari, which is the church of San Nicola, okay? The San Nicolaus church. Um, it's very important in Bari, which is also the holy saint of the city, okay? Uh, which makes it super important for the Barese people, okay? But also for some other nationalities. So, for example, in Bari, we have a lot of Russian people coming because San Nicolaus, of course, is the holy saint of, the, uh, of them too. And also all the people from Northern Europe um, coming down, especially like the, the Dutch, the Scandinavian, uh, because San Nicolaus, it's their Santa Claus. So all of them, they want to come down, you know, and pay a tribute to, to San Nicolaus. Um, then I would say Bari, it's a destination where you would want to stay like two day, two nights and one full day. You know, within a tour of Puglia. Um, other two things that I wanted to point out, of course, and then this goes into well into the imperial Puglia. One is Castel del Monte, which is this very unique castle, as is it called today. Uh, however, it was most likely like a summer residence for King Frederick II. Okay, it has this octagonal shape. I mean, something that apparently it doesn't exist anywhere else in in the world uh, it's it's one of the sites that you want to see in uh, in northern Puglia definitely uh, it takes a couple of hours I would say it's an hour away from Bari and it's a beautiful uh, excursion okay and then it usually combines with Trani which is a, a very small yet very nice like seaside resort um, it used to be a city back in the days okay and it used to be a city because it has this beautiful building here overlooking the sea which is a cathedral uh, it's the only cathedral that we have in Italy right on the beach basically uh, which gives you like a very unique like um, opportunity to take pictures and to visit um, a, a very a very different uh, very different site uh, the last thing that I noted here it's this area called Gargano okay I want to show you where it is which is right here okay and very top of uh, the region of Puglia uh, which is very common for Italians to go and visit it's mostly like a beachside uh, destinations and uh, in line instead of the mountain so it's good for hiking and trekking um, definitely I would say you know for people that would return to Puglia like the second or the third time okay for the first time I would definitely visit Bari, Trani and Castel del Monte as a first timer okay and then I'm going to move to the center, which is mostly the, uh, I mean, which is the, the place where, uh, the places which are the most interesting and the, uh, the most known places uh, worldwide um, about Puglia. So the three that I pointed out here are those that really made Puglia uh, famous worldwide. The first one is Albero Bello, okay? We saw the Trulli, which is this very unique building, you know, you can see uh, all around. Albero Bello, it's, now it's, it's a bigger place but like uh, up to like 40 50 years ago it was solely made out of this uh this kind of building okay it's the the concentration makes it unique okay so the city center is only made of houses made in this particular way um today i mean you can go and visit them some of them have been turned into museums um some of them are actually uh, hotels or suites that you can rent and you can stay uh some of them I would say I have a standard level of quality. Some of them are very nice and they're in the luxury. Um, I would definitely recommend to go and stay there because I mean, the, the experience that you have there is kind of unique. Um, very interesting to go and visit uh, those um, recreation of how the life in a Trulla was because today, you know, I mean, a house could be formed by different Trulli. So let's say you can pick like a house like this and you have like two or three Trulla that makes a unique house. And then each different room is a different trullo. For example, you have like one which is a living room, one is a kitchen, one is a bedroom, one is another bedroom, for example. Back in the days, instead, you know, every little hut was a single house. And then it's interesting to see the reproductions where, for example, it was like kind of divided. And then the ground floor was actually where uh, the, the, the day life was taking place. So there is a, um, a kitchen, there is like a, some sort of living space. And then up in the attic, there was actually all the beds or whatever they call beds you know and the family were living all together so um, it's interesting to go and, and, and visit you know it's kind of unique uh, to see also i suggest to stay at night because when it, the, the, the sun goes down the light comes up you know it's a beautiful place to stay at
Um, then you have like not too far, uh, Ostuni, which is also called the white city, as you can see here. This is actually not on the beach. I mean, while the sea, you can see not too far away. And um, it's unique because it, it's up in the mountain and you can see pretty much from everywhere in central Puglia. Uh, you can imagine like a big, like um, a big town like this, all painted white. Okay. And especially like in the summertime when the sun is shining very, uh, very strong, you know, it kind of reflects it. Uh, all over the place. It's beautiful, okay, it's beautiful to see. I mean, uh, the best would be to to go up where the church is, to drop off your car, and then to walk around, kind of like to, to lose yourself in the small streets and alleys, and then pick and choose like any restaurants, and then you have a beautiful time in Ostuni, okay? Um, the last one that I would really like to go, it's called Polignano Mare. Um, again, Center Puglia, it's very small, okay? So all of these destinations are probably like 30, 35, 40 minutes away one from the other. So one day you can see different, and that's the beauty of Puglia, you know, a fly and drive or, you know, a tour of Puglia, that's where you really want to go, okay? You want to probably pick like a, um, a place to stay in Northern Puglia and spend a few days there, do the same in center and then the south, okay? That I would say the best way to do it. Um, going back to Polignano, this is one of my favorite as well, okay? It's um, it's very Pugliese, it's right by the beach, okay? You can see here, I mean, the picture probably doesn't show you very well, but like this is the beach and it's between like the left and the south and the left and the right side of Polignano, okay? Uh, which is a beautiful white town, okay? Um, overlooking the, the, the sea, it is a bit high up, okay? There is all these rock formations out, out here. So that makes like uh, the access to the beach kind of limited, but the water is amazing. You can see it's all green. It's beautiful to go up to this free beach, you know, for you know for an afternoon of uh, of, uh, of swimming or sunbathing. Um, one thing that you really want to do in Polignano is actually uh, there are some restaurants that are actually built and uh, like digged into caves around here. So basically, the entrance to the restaurant would be like on the street level, and there is like stairs or an elevator that will take you all the way through the rocks like pretty much water level but you're like usually eating a, a very uh, unique place between the water and the rock formation on top of you um it's beautiful it's beautiful especially like at night um with the breeze and then uh, they usually have like uh, some small shows like uh, made on boats coming for for the people that actually eating there okay um and then let me finish off with the south of Puglia, which I would say it is, I mean, two things to remember about the, the, the south of Puglia. The region, within the region, is called Salento, okay? It starts from Brindisi, okay? And then it goes all the way down to the very bottom of the region, okay? To the, to the very bottom of the hill. Um, this area is has uh, been very popular in the past 10 years within Italian as well. Okay, mainly because it turned into a beach destination for Italians. I mean, you can see locations like Otranto or Gallipoli, the beach and the water area is just amazing. Okay, so people from Milan, from Torino, from Venice, you know, they would drive 10, 11 hours, no problem, you know, to spend a summer vacation in a place like this. Um, I mean, for uh, Americans, okay, for our American clients, of course, uh, I mean, most of them, they would say they're much more after the cultural side of Puglia rather than the beach side of Puglia. So we definitely suggest um, Salento for a visit, okay? Uh, also because towns like Otranto and Gallipoli are beautiful. But then we usually suggest them to stay in, uh, in a place like Lecce, which is the southern city, okay, in Salento. It's truly baroque okay it has a, a, a very relaxed and uh, interesting vibe okay um it is a city but it's not very big so you can definitely walk everywhere you can see here this is actually a, a usual summer evening all these people around you know just walking up and down okay and by staying in Lecce you know you can drive in and out of Otranto, Gallipoli, Santa Maria di Leuca, all the other towns, you know, during the day for the visit, we can go for lunch, you can even stay for dinner if you want. But then we suggest them to go back to Lecce or to a Masseria, which is like a countryside resort um, style of location. Um, because the problem that we do have now in Otranto, Gallipoli and all the other seaside resort is actually, especially in the summer, let's say June to September, these places get very crowded and full of Italians, okay? So um, the prices, they go up, you know, the um, uh, even the traffic. I mean, 
it sounds silly, you know, but the traffic could be a problem there because, you know, they're very small places. And then when you have like a town that it's usually 1,000 inhabitants, turns like 10, 15,000, like for a matter, I mean, in the summer, you know, everything gets super crowded. Finding a parking spot, even getting into the town, it's, uh, um, it could be like a problem. Um, and then just to, to get over, I mean, out of Puglia, just one second, uh, we always suggest to, to add to your visit to Puglia, uh, Matera and Altamura. Altamura, it is still in Puglia, it's actually uh, 30 minutes inland from Bari. And then Matera, it's actually one hour inland from, uh, from Bari. So it could be like a place that you can stay like for two days or it, just for a, a day visit if you wanted to, to do some extra from Bari. Okay, Matera, it became super famous last year, especially in Europe, because it was elected the European Capital of Culture in 2019. And that really helped uh, the Matera people to put the locations on the map. Um, in the US, I reckon it, turned to be very famous after I think Mel Gibson um, took his movie, The Passion of Christ uh, in Matera, okay? So if you watch that movie, that was pretty much entirely like a uh, shot in, uh, in Matera and then well, actually it was put on the map in the US market. Um, the city itself, it is a very unique place. It's one of the places where when I still go, you know, and you go home in the evening, you close your eyes and you, and you think like, where the hell have I been? Because there is nothing that I've seen in the world like similar to this. Uh, so the concept of Matera is actually, there is like a above ground town, okay? And then below ground town. This is the, the big division of the city. So if you can see here on the left, okay, this is actually where the above ground town starts. So let's see, you're walking around Matera above ground, you're in a, in, in a normal city, okay? I mean, Baroque, you know, with the city center, churches and everything. Up to when you, when you start looking down, and then there is a massive cave that you can see down here. It's actually two. Uh, they have two different names. It's actually one on the left, one on the right in the main center. And uh, where you would see just a, you know, a, a big, hole in the mountain instead the people you know they back in the days this dates back centuries okay they pretty much created the city down there okay it is a, it is a unique way of building um everything you see here is actually not just the house but the entrance of the houses since like the the, the biggest part of the house that you see here is actually built in caves okay so basically they start living in caves in caves and then they built the entrance to look like a house in front of it so it looks like a village but instead it is a village made of caves um it is honestly a unique place to visit it's beautiful to walk around up to today not 100 percent of the of the town has been rebuilt and looked after so it's very common that you walk around and you find yourself in an area which is completely uh you know run down and waiting for somebody to, to, to take over, you know, and to, and to restore the place. Uh, today, the, the, the best, uh, of course, uh, caves and, and locations have been turned into hotels. Some of them are like four and five stars. They're beautiful, okay? They're being completely redone. It's a unique experience to live, uh, to stay there at night. Uh, because, of course, it's a destination with a lot of tourists that would come during the day, you know, as an excursion and leave in the evening. So once you're there in the evening, it's kind of like it changes completely. Of course, the lighting, but also because there is very few people staying at night and it's beautiful to walk around, you know, and to see uh, this, this, this place at night. Okay. Uh, and just to spend like one more word on Altamura. Uh, Altamura, it's usually associated with Matera when you're in Bari. It's, um, again, it's a Baroque town on the way. It's beautiful to walk around. Um, the important thing about Altamura, it's, it's very famous, especially in Italy, for the Altamura bread, il pane di Altamura. Um, this is how it looks like, okay? It's very famous, and then in all the gourmet restaurants and bakery and shops all around Italy, you would find it. Um, it's kind of like a heavy kind of bread, okay? It's very thick and firm, and um, it's very tasty, and it usually lasts up to seven to 10 days, okay? So that's it characteristic um it's very famous so most of the people that go to altamura they will definitely pop into a bakery a local bakery and buy one or two to bring back home um there is one we always suggest it's called panificio del gesù which is the literally like a jesus uh, bakery okay uh, it's named like this because i mean it's, it's 
I mean, the, the history is very long. You know, it, it was the bakery of a convent, and then it's, you know, it's a, it's a very long history. But it's still active after I think three or four hundred years. Uh, so the good thing is to go there. You know, you go into the bakery, which is a very normal bakery, and then you ask them if you can see the, the oven. And then uh, if you're in a good day, you know, they open it up for you and then you can take pictures and there's a big wood oven, um, you know, it's been like in service for more than 300 years for sure. And then it's very nice, very proud of it. So they like to take pictures and everything. And you can look online. I mean, there's millions of pictures of people like um, that took with this oven. Okay. And uh, I think that's it. I didn't want to take too much of your time. Okay, guys. Um, but Liz, let me know if you have any question, if anybody has any question about Puglia. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, we do indeed. We did get one question, in, Federico, if you can potentially answer this for us. We had a question from Jean, who said that her husband's ha family have okay. relations in Avellino. And can you do a side trip there from any of the, the main yeah, sites in definitely. Puglia fairly well, easily? Avellino is, um, okay, is on the other side. Avellino is, is basically in, uh, in Campania. Okay, but um, I mean, it, the best way from Avellino would probably be to go to Bari. Okay, that's the easiest, uh, the easiest way. Okay, it's uh, I would say it's two hours by car. Okay, and then um, honestly, from there okay. you have to cross Italy, and then you will get in from Trani. Okay, so um, from Avellino, the best would be to visit mm -hmm. the northern part of Puglia, so Trani, um, Castel del Monte, and Bari. Okay, and then maybe on the way back, they can do Altamura, Matera, and go back to Avellino. That would be a nice, uh, a nice itinerary for them to, okay. to do from Avellino, definitely. Absolutely. And some great wine in Avellino, too. They have a fantastic fiano. Definitely, definitely. Nice white wine. Yeah, we love it. Do you know the fiano in Avellino? Yeah. Really good wine. Okay. Uh, next thing I have to do is just announce the winner that we had for our first competition, which is Brian Wilkes. He was the first person to answer correctly. So hopefully, Brian, you will be able to use these on your next trip and enjoy. Um, thanks for that presentation. That was great. Uh, really was pure escapism. And, you know, I think me and a million other people just feel like yeah. we want to be there now. So having not been able travel for so long and I'm sure I'm definitely not the only one who feels like Italy is her spiritual home I feel like when I land in Italy I just feel like whoa you know I just want to be there so hopefully next year all right so the next area that we're going to have a look at today is the Tuscan countryside and um, before that we've got a little video that we're going to show on the region of Florence and I just want to say that although we're featuring Florence in the video today we're going to focus on what you can do in the countryside around Tuscany obviously you're going to want to include Florence in your itinerary as well but our focus for today is going to be on the countryside so Liz if we could go ahead and play that video that would be great and we'll be back shortly Yeah, I guess. An entire week among churches and museums. Wow. Oh, ragazzi, non penserete mica che Firenze sia tutto lì, eh? Tu pure principessa della tua fede.
I love that video. <laughs> so it just shows that there is definitely more to Florence than churches. You can do a hell of a lot more there. So before we launch into that next presentation, our next competition is for a free wine tasting experience that we will include on in Italy itinerary when you book through tenant tours. The question for this one, again, which you will hear during the presentation, is what grape variety is Tuscany most known for? So again, send your answers in the comments question and the first one to answer will win the prize. And just before we should move on, we move on. I just want to thank the Italian Tourist Board for giving us those videos to use uh, this evening. I just want to credit them for that. And then let's talk about Tuscany. Perfect. Okay. Okay, I see that on the comments that Brian says Vincero. Very well. <laughs> I'm very good. <laughs> I like it. Good, good we'll Brian. Okay. We will win. Share the screen again. Okay, one second. And then let me take you to let me know when you see my screen in Tuscan countryside. I will. Okay. There you go. Yeah. Okay. All right, perfect. Okay, so this goes back pretty much to the, the what we said before. Okay, um, okay. The, the the new the new requests that we're getting are definitely uh, focusing on the countryside and open air uh, location. So Puglia is definitely one. Tuscan countryside, of course, is in in the, in the imaginary dreams of everybody that wants to come to Italy. I think also for many Italians, you know, it's like your dream destination. Um, today, what we wanted to to put in the, in the presentation was actually to um, to explain the, like the, the, like a few different areas within the Tuscan countryside that you would want to visit and why. Because the region itself, and, and I go direct like into the presentation. Okay, of course, the, the region of Tuscany, it's uh, I mean, it's right in the center of Italy, and it's very different. Of course, you have all the, the the seaside resorts and areas like on the left, of course, and then you have all the mountains in the north. Okay, the mountains like on the uh, on the eastern side, and then uh, the, the countryside itself can be very very different from north to south. Um, the one that we definitely suggest you to um, to visit uh, because of its beauty, because of the destinations that are within the countryside, are usually enclosed between the town of Florence, well, the city of Florence, okay, San Gimignano, Siena, and Pienza. Okay, so just for you to remember the, the nicest, I would say, part of the Tuscan countryside, you look at Florence and then you go south. Okay, stay right in the heart of the region, um, and that's why. Okay. And the three regions that we wanted to point out today, it's of course the Chianti area, the Valdelsa, and the Valdorcia. Okay, just remember these three, and then if you're able to visit those three where you're in, in Tuscany, you have pretty much covered everything you really want to see in terms of countryside. Um, this, I mean, this map is probably not the best, but gives an idea, okay, of where the, the areas are. So, Chianti is the first one, okay. Florence is right here on the north, okay? And then Chianti really starts at the border with Florence. Um, so it is a very easy area to visit, both when you are in Florence, but also we start an offer in the way around. So you stay in Chianti, so when you, and then you visit Florence for the day, or for half a day, or for half a day plus a lunch and a dinner, okay? Uh, so in this way, you get the best of the, of, of the both. When you're back in your residence, you know, in the middle of the countryside, you can, for example, have beautiful dinners and beautiful wine tasting without, without worrying about like traveling back to Florence, for example. Uh, so Chianti, most of the town in Chianti, the one you want to visit, they're very easy to spot because they always say Chianti in the name. So you have Radda in Chianti, Greve in Chianti, Gaiola in Chianti, Castellini in Chianti. So that's pretty easy to find out. Okay, this is the first area. Then the second one uh, that you will want to visit is called Valdelsa. It, of course, is the valley of the Elsa River. Okay, it's uh, between Florence and Siena. Okay, the, the, the main way that you would take, you know, by car, by bus uh, from Florence to Siena would drive through um, Poggi Bonzi, Colle Valdezza, and then Siena. Um, leave Poggi Bonzi out. Colle Valdezza, it's a beautiful medieval place to visit, not very known to touristic. Um, routes okay but definitely i always suggest people to to stop and visit okay it takes about two hours uh but definitely the most important and famous is san gimignano most of you probably have heard of it and uh, i'll um 
I'll have some pictures later and explain to you why is it famous. Um, the usual day trip from Florence is actually leaving from Florence, going to San Gimignano, then going to Siena, and then going back to Florence. That is perfect for one day. Since it's a triangle, you can decide to be each of the three points, okay? So you can stay in Siena and go to San Gimignano and then Florence and back, all the way around and it always works, okay? The, the last area that we uh, want to show, it's that's this one in the very south. It's called Val d'Orcia. Again, the Valley of the Orcia River. And this, it's probably less known because of the cities, but when I show you the pictures, you immediately recognize. So the, the stereotype of the Tuscan countryside, okay, with this very, uh, we, we call it like soft hills, so like uh, like very um, harmonic countryside. That's where you're gonna find it. Okay. Um, so to start with, the Chianti area, as as I was talking before, uh, of course it's famous worldwide for for the wine. Okay, the wine Chianti, uh, although in Italy and back in the days it was not like a, a very um, it was well known, but it wasn't a precious wine. It was a wine that you would drink every day. We call it like a table wine. Now, of course, there are actually different um, different variety of Chianti, but it has always been like a like a, a very let me allow you to say like a simple wine. I mean, more precious wine in Tuscany would be the Montepulciano, or the, it would be the and the Brunello, the Sassicaia, this is a much more important one. We call it the Super Toscan, for example. Um, most of them are actually made of Sangiovese, which is like the most common grapes, of course, like in, in, in Tuscany, but also in many parts of, uh, of Italy. In Tuscany, the way they, they, they work it, okay, then they turn into Chianti. In other regions, keeps the name of Sangiovese. Sangiovese wine is a beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, table wine also to drink. Um, I don't go too much into the um, the details of the of each city, but of course the thing to remember in Chianti is actually you have plenty of activities to do related to wine. Okay, um, we love you to stay, for example, in Castellina in Chianti or Greve in Chianti. Okay, which are like towns. Okay most of the time are like 30 35 minutes drive from florence so we make them a perfect location to stay while visiting florence and the countryside if you do not want to stay like in the city um also in some of these places on an, in a normal year okay you will definitely either save some money okay or for the same amount of money you would spend in Florence, you could definitely stay in a much better place. Um, especially if you stay for a long time and you would want to, to, to pick a residence for a longer period, like four, five, even seven nights, and then use it to go and visit the, the Tuscan countryside. That is very common and it's something we really suggest you to do um, if you also would like to use the facilities of your hotel, such as like the, the, the pool, for example, or the restaurant. Okay, so that's for the county. Um, Valdelsa, this needs a little bit more, uh, more explanation. Of course, this is the picture of San Gimignano, which is a UNESCO site, it's been globally known for, uh, I mean, for it, it's, uh, its landscape. Um, all the towers are actually the, uh, the iconic um, features of San Gimignano. Uh, when you're there, most of the tour guides will tell you that this is actually the New York City of uh, medieval times. Um, now we have about 20 to 25 towers still standing, but back in medieval times, it was more than 100. Uh, so you can imagine, you know, like in 1500, you know, to have like a village, because today we recognize village back in the days was a city, you know, 100 towers. Um, it was like a, a unique, uh, a unique thing back in the days. Um, the, the town itself it did preserve very well uh, in the years because when the Black Pay Plague came to to Tuscany in 1600, um, pretty much the entire city got. Did, I mean, pretty much everybody either died, unfortunately, or they left the city. And the city has been untouched for centuries. So when the first inhabitants start to move back to San Gimignano after so many, so many years, you know, nothing has been touched. So except for most of the towers has been like uh, pulled down and ruined or like they collapsed by themselves, you know, everything else really uh, is as it was like centuries ago. It's a beautiful locations to go. Uh, 
we usually, when we design a tour, we try to stay away from the weekend in San Gimignano because that's where most of the daily tour they would come. Um, and they would kind of like spoil a little bit of the atmosphere you would get in San Gimignano. Okay. But definitely this is a place that you want to go or stay as well. The other one, um, it's called Volterra. Okay. This is, uh, it dates back even more. This goes back to the Etruscan populations. This the Etruscans is actually coming before the Romans uh, at the age of bronze. So this really goes back a lot, a lot of time. Okay. Volterra is very famous because you still have a lot of, um, uh, a lot of people like digging the, the ground to still find um, tombs or um, you know like uh, the art crafts and they they left. Um, it's very interesting, much less known abroad, I would say, than in Italy. Okay, because the Etruscan, you know, to to the Italians, kind of like the uh, the, the beginners of the the, the, the Italian. Uh, culture and then mo even most of the Roman culture has been based on the Etruscan uh, legacy. Um, therefore, very interesting. I would suggest it if you're much into history to go and see Volterra because visiting there and visiting the Volterra Museum, you understand a lot about the Etruscan and therefore, you know, um, the, the Romans and therefore everybody else that came uh, that came afterwards. Okay. Um, otherwise, I would just say just stick to San Gimignano and go for a nice Fiorentina steak in uh, in Colle Valdesa, and then you you cover the Valdesa itself. Okay. Um, Another very nice town in uh, in Colle Valdesa, very close to Siena, is called Monte Rigioni, which is this one that you see in the picture. Okay, it's barely like a square. You can see here a few houses, but its uh, its, uh, the, its uniqueness is actually is on top of a hill, surrounded by olive trees, and it's it looks like a fortress fortress from the outside. Okay, when you're driving by uh, and from Florence to Siena, you will definitely spot it because it's kind of unique. You know, all the walls are still standing and still remaining, and it's beautiful to take pictures. Honestly, I really like walls in the evening because when you get there during the day, it's full of people, of course. Of course. In the evening, it's beautiful in the summer, you know, to sit down in the square and have a meal there because it's very quiet and it gives you the opportunity to, um, to walk around the town at night, which is, I mean, it's kind of unreal, you know. I mean, it's... Um, it's, it's beautiful and it is just like uh, everything kind of like untouched and dates back to the 1200. So definitely we're talking about a, a, a very historical, very historical site. Um, if you want to visit during the day, you would allow like two hours, including like uh, parking your car, walking up hill and, and, and a coffee. Okay. You don't really need a, a guide there. It's very, very small. Okay, um, and then the other one, it's uh, of course the, the Val d'Orcia. Val d'Orcia, here you can see the pictures of what I was talking about. So this, I mean, is the place where you want to go and take pictures of the countryside. I mean, all those places where you can see the cypress trees, okay, all around, you know, the very, uh, the very nice hills, you know, the, the countryside turning uh, turning gray, turning green, okay, the Val d'Orcia is the place to be. Um, it is, however, you know, um, I mean, sorry, it is on top of that, like a UNESCO site, which came and they actually recognized the beauty of the landscape as a UNESCO uh, site to be preserved, okay? It's one of the few in Italy, like the Dolomites, the, the Val d'Orcia, you know, usually they preserve like man-made things in Italy, for example, historical artifacts, you know, uh, monuments, churches, and so on. But Dutch is a very, um, is a very unique one for us. Um, and uh, let me see if I did. Okay, yes, I did put in Baldorcia, there's actually two very important things that I would suggest you to visit when you're there and look in the countryside. One is Montalcino, okay, which is a beautiful medieval town, okay, um, hilltop, okay, very typical, beautiful for, uh, for a visit, takes a lot of pictures, but there you would like to leave your car and to, day, and to take like a, a day tour of, or a half day tour to visit the wineries, because this is where they make the Brunello di Montalcino. Okay, uh, um, probably you probably like known about it. It's a very unique wine. It's a uh, Rosso di Montalcino. It's a I would say a very good um, standard red wine. That uh, it's the only one that's been aged in oak barrels for five years, and then when it turns into Brunello di Montalcino, um, it's uh, it's it is one of the super Toscan wine. 
uh, the Burani Montalcino could be very expensive, okay? Uh, because it aged in, in oak barrels for such a long time, you know, you can find bottles like from 1950s, 1960s, and they can go up to a few thousand euros per bottle. Um, if you go to the to the latest one, you know, those ones that are five, six, seven years old, I mean, you can easily buy them for like 30, 35, 40 euros the bottle. It makes it like a perfect present because I know in the US they're very, very expensive, probably like five, six times more. Okay. And the other one, it's Pienza. Okay. Pienza is, uh, it is a very interesting town. Okay. It's fairly big. Okay. It has a, it has a cathedral and uh, it is um, a beautiful spot because it's on top of a hill to take pictures of the countryside. It's right in the middle of the, um, uh, of, of where you want to be basically to take pictures. Uh, it has a 360 degrees view of the countryside. Beautiful to go usually in the afternoon so you can visit the, um, the, the town and then take a picture uh, of the countryside while it, it changes color like over the sunset. Um, Pienza, it is also very famous for the pecorino cheese. Pecorino di Pienza, which is of course a goat uh, milk cheese, okay, um, it's, uh, it, it is like super famous in Italy. Usually when you say pecorino in Italy, you would think about Pienza, which is kind of funny because it's a very small town, but it's so famous that you really want to try when you're there. And of course, the perfect combination is to sit in the square of Pienza and eat a, and do your pecorino cheese tasting with a glass of Brunello. That will be the very end of it, okay? So I hope you can make it happen because it's one of my favorite things to do in Tuscany, <laughs> okay? Um, Montepulciano, of course, it's, uh, I mean, I could go on forever. I mean, this is how they look like. Um, they all... Uh, all very old medieval villages okay beautiful to take pictures beautiful to walk around you know because the atmosphere is kind of unique and it's very different from one to the other it's very nice to go on, on a tour of different of them and then at the end of the tours you know you always find somebody that is own favorite town for whatever reason you know because they found a specific view a specific corner a church a restaurant um it's very, very nice to uh, to go and discover it just in countryside. And then again, if you stick to these three areas, I would think I would say that you have a very good overview of what the, the Tuscan countryside is, and uh, you would bring back like beautiful memories, definitely. Okay. Um, then, of course, I mean, we did add um, three major cities within the Tuscan countryside. Okay, that kind of like avoided before, but definitely, you know, that, that need to be mentioned. One definitely Siena. Siena in Colle Valdesa, okay, again as a UNESCO site, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful to visit, okay, uh, definitely allowed to stay like a full day in Siena, okay, you can, I mean, it's beautiful to just to lose yourself in the streets of Siena, it's so beautiful, you can go and visit the Palazzo del Buon Consiglio, which is this one, uh, in right in the Piazza del Campo, which is this unique uh, square, which is all inclined, and it's, it makes a, a unique effect when you're there. Um, the Palazzo Buon Consiglio, again, it's, it's, it's beautiful to go and visit inside and history of medieval times, how, you know, the cities, um, they were managed, okay, and then it, it is called Palazzo del Buon Consiglio, so meaning like of the good governance, for example, because inside, in the, in, in the main, um, in the main room, when like the, the city council would probably would usually gather together, you know, there's actually um, big um, frescoes of showing you, uh, of showing to the city council people what good government is and bad government is. And it's uh, it's very interesting, it's very funny because when we're talking about like uh, medieval times and then the, the people that put up the fresco already had a very clear ideas of uh, what about politics was back then. And somehow it's, uh, it's very uh, contemporary still. Okay, uh, Siena, of course, is very famous for the Palio, which is a horse race that takes place twice a year in the square. Okay, um, very chaotic when the Palio is there. Um, I mean, there are, um, I mean, uh, there are a lot of clients that ask us to go and see the Palio. It's very, very difficult and very expensive because the entrance to the main square, which is, of course, all this area here, it's free of charge. Okay. The only thing is actually once you're in, you, you're not allowed to leave. 
okay? Because of course the, 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 the race takes place like around you, okay? There is no toilet, there's no water, there's no nothing, okay? And then the, the palio itself is a very unique a horse race because you don't know when it's going to start. It's very quick when it does, but there are certain rules, you know, they're very, um, uh, I'd say, uh, uh, very unique for the, the race to be able to start. So, like, all the horses need to be aligned in a certain way and everything needs to be in place. And then it could take like two minutes to start, but it could take even hours. So, I mean, we definitely do not suggest people to go. And, and see the palio from inside, you know, if, if they even, I mean, if they don't have like a, um, all this information. Uh, taking a seat on the side, it could be three, four hundred, five hundred euros, depending on the palio, depending on the year. Okay, just for you to know. Um, the second city that we wanted to suggest you to visit on your your tour in the countryside is Lucca. Okay, very unique. Okay, probably less known than than, uh, than other other cities. Okay, um, the uniqueness of Lucca it's this circular square which is the very heart of the city. Uh, it is a square today, but it used to be a Roman amphitheater like before. So uh, as you can see, you can if you can imagine the Colosseum, for example. In the centuries, people started going and living into the areas of the the amphitheater and then slowing turning the amphitheater into houses this is how you know the the people kind of like got the ownership of, uh, of the amphitheater and turned into a square um, it's beautiful it's it's very unique as a conversion um, and the, in the town itself it's usually not as crowded uh, with tourists as, for example, Pisa and Siena and Florence. So I would say very nice to go and visit if you stay uh, for a long time. Uh, very nice Italian atmosphere still today, okay? And the last one, of course, is Pisa, okay? Pisa itself, it's kind of out of the way. Uh, we usually put in the itinerary for people uh, that used to fly with Delta into Pisa. Uh, remember there was a, a direct flight and then we used to, to, to keep them there like the first day or the last day uh, so they can recover from jet lag and, and visit the, uh, the, the, the city. Um, Pisa, remember, I mean, it's very limited usually what you, what you see there. Usually two hours to, to three hours max, uh, you pretty much covered everything. Um, the city itself, it is nice but it's not something you want to spend your time on when you're in florence on a on, on a flying drive tour or on a visit okay the main thing you want to go and see is piazza dei miracoli so it's the miracle square which of course includes the linen tower of pisa the church and the battistero okay um it is beautiful of course you're going to get there you can uh, take pictures of the Tower of Pisa, which is actually the bell tower of the main church itself. That's what the really the Linen Tower of Pisa is. Um, and then you visit the, the other two monuments on the square and then off you go. Because that's honestly what we suggest you to do when you're in Pisa. And then you spend your time somewhere else. Um, the usual question about visiting and entering the Tower of Pisa, yes, you can do it. Okay, it's very limited, okay. Um, you I have to make sure you tell tenant tours like one in advance, then you want to visit it so we can book it for you. We can book in the time slot and the day that you require. Uh, it gets filled up a lot quickly, okay? This year is very difficult and very different to to talk, but uh, usually that's what it happens. Uh, however, if you book like a, a few months in advance, three, four, five, six months in advance, that's the best time so we can build into your itinerary and um, then you have it set. Okay, um, this is more question, more more information about Pisa. Um, however, you know I would stick to what I said, you know, to Piazza dei Miracoli and to move on to something else in Tuscany. Okay, and once again, grazie e arrivederci, Liz. Back to you. Perfecto, grazie mille. Wow, there's uh, lots of ideas and uh, inspiration there. So uh, yeah, Tuscany is amazing. Personally, I've been to Florence, I've done Luca, Siena, San Gimignano, and Pienza, and all amazing. Am I right in thinking that Pienza is where the movie The English um, Patient was filmed? I'm not a movie person. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Okay. Okay. Somebody else might do that one for me. Um, it was a, it was a while ago. Um, anyway, just to let anybody know that might have joined the presentation late and is really interested in going over this information again, it will be on the Facebook page, so you can play it again at your own pace and pause the presentation at anything that particularly takes your fancy. So a couple of things I got to do. Uh, I got to announce the competition winner. And for the first time ever, we have a double competition winner. So Brian is on fire tonight. So Brian has also Yay. won the free wine tasting um, if you book over to Italy with us. So congratulations to you, Brian. We will be in touch. And as a bonus, first time we've ever done a bonus either, we're going to offer a free wine tasting as part of any tour in Italy booked with us, um, booked through Tenant Tours who, if you share our video and book with us by the 31st of December this year for travel in the next two years. So get in touch with us on that. Um, I don't see any questions on Tuscany. I think everybody hopefully is just uh, enraptured by all of the information and the visuals and wanting to be transformed there for the nice scenery, food and wine and everything else that goes with it. Um, keep an eye there. Yeah, no, no questions coming. So again, thank you, Federico, for your time as thank always. You. It's great to chat with you. We've been working together for almost three years now. So it's been really great developing our Italy business with you guys. Thanks to everybody else for joining in. Do keep an eye on the Facebook page for any future live streams that we will have coming up. Our next one, I can tell you, will be on Monday, the 9th of November. And that one will have an Irish flavor. We'll be talking to Epic, the Irish Emigration Museum. So we'll be looking at the history of the Irish in the world. Believe me, we get everywhere. We go everywhere. Uh, we will also be looking at ancestry. So if you have somebody that's interested in tracing family roots and that kind of thing do join us monday 9th of november again at 3 p.m eastern standard time for that one for now i think all that's left to say is grazie ancora buona serata a tutti and grazie federico ciao ciao a tutti Perfetto. ciao buona serata